Libraries are one of the cornerstones of a democratic society. Ever since man could write, he's needed a way to organize his writings. Libraries have been around in some form as long as writing has been around, since the time of writing on clay tablets even. In ancient times, libraries and information was only available to the elite and powerful. Royalty, the wealthy, and religious groups. We're talking about back when the Roman Catholic Church ruled most of the Western world. Books were expensive. They were crafted by hand. Ancient Greek and Roman texts were copied and preserved by Muslim scholars as early as the 8th and 9th centuries. Catholic monks also preserved ancient writings by copying them in Latin, which was the language of the church, thereby disseminating knowledge throughout the Middle Ages. Knowledge was power. In the Western world during this time, only the rich and powerful could read and write, and the language of the educated was the language of the church. The Roman Catholic Church ruled the Western world. Normal, everyday people had to believe what they were told by the people who could read and write Latin, which is how those in power kept their power. In the 1440s, a man named Johann Gutenberg found that if he carved letters backwards and lined them up in trays, spread ink over them, then put a piece of paper down on them and pressed evenly down on the paper. When you pulled the paper up, you would have a completely printed piece of paper. The invention of the printing press suddenly changed the game. Now you could print books in a matter of hours in any language you desired. What do you imagine is the first book Johann Gutenberg printed on that printing press? It was a Bible. The printing press ranks right up there with the wheel as far as inventions that change the world. Literacy exploded. All of a sudden, people could access information in their own native language at a much more affordable cost. A middle class began to develop as people became more educated and able to own their own books and have knowledge at their fingertips. In the 1600s, academic and government libraries began to be founded. The Bodleian Library at Oxford University in England was founded in 1602. In 1637, over a hundred years before the American Revolution, John Harvard donated his personal library to what would become Harvard University. And in 1800, Thomas Jefferson donated his personal library to the United States Congress because he felt our congressional representatives should have immediate access to information. The Bodleian Library at Oxford University in England and the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., serve as storehouses of the common knowledge of their respective countries. Each library reserves one copy of each book published in their country each year. Your instructor, Dr. Cardenas, has published a book, and a copy resides at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., as part of the permanent record of our collective knowledge. As printing and literacy increased, so did the demand for books. So libraries began to open to the public. Benjamin Franklin founded a lending library in Philadelphia in 1731, where you could pay, say, the equivalent to a nickel subscription fee for a year to check out books. The first public library that we would recognize, that is, supported by tax dollars, opened in Peterborough, New Hampshire in 1833, about 30 years before the Civil War, just to give you a perspective on the timeline here. You will learn about businessman Andrew Carnegie in your History 1302 classes. He was a businessman in the late 18, early 1900s. He was a steel magnate, the Bill Gates or Elon Musk of his time. He was filthy rich. Carnegie believed that he should give back to society out of his abundance. One of the ways he chose to do that was to build libraries. You will find Carnegie libraries all across the United States. This is a picture of the one that used to be in downtown Houston, now sadly gone. The deal was that Carnegie would donate money for the building if the city would then promise to support and maintain the library. He made it possible for many cities, large and small, to have temples to literacy and learning. Public libraries provide free access to information for everyone. They're one of the last places in our society that you can walk into and spend time without being expected to pay for anything. They're air-conditioned in the summer, heated in the winter, 
There's free Wi-Fi, computers to use, books to read, water fountains. You could stay all day, and as long as you behave yourself and follow a few behavioral rules, you won't be asked to leave or to buy anything. I like the way the cats in this cartoon see the public library. A library is where a community shares the best parts of society. Knowledge, literature, art, companionship, and puppets. Oh, and librarians are the last real wizards. Public libraries provide all kinds of services that are paid for by your property tax dollars. Free English classes so that new immigrants can learn English. Help with resumes, job fairs for the unemployed or underemployed computer classes for seniors and young adults, story time and summer reading clubs for children, computers, maker spaces, and more. Libraries also check out items other than books. Most public libraries will check out engraving tools so that you can etch the VIN number of your car into your car windows and get a discount on your car insurance. Some libraries check out cake pans. How many times do you think you're actually going to use that $30 Elmo cake pan? Check it out from the library for free. At the San Jacinto College Library, we check out boxes of rocks to students taking geology so they can study for their lab tests. We also have boxes of bones so that students taking anatomy and physiology can check out to study in microscopes and slides for biology students. All of that is just a small sample. Here's what one of your local libraries was able to do with their makerspace. They got their volunteers together and 3D printed a prosthetic arm for a little girl in Victoria. The quotes on this slide are from the article. Everyone donated their time, expertise, and materials, and the whole thing cost about $100. The family had to pay nothing. This is the kind of a good thing that can come of having a vibrant, active public library. The library you belong to depends on several factors. Where you live, where you go to school, even where you work. Because you pay property taxes to Harris County in the city of Pasadena, you can use the Harris County Public Library and the Pasadena Public Library free of charge. Your tax dollars support those libraries. Because you're a San Jacinto College student, you can use the San Jacinto College Libraries at all three campuses. Rice University is a private university, and they only let their students use their library. In fact, their students pay astronomical library fees every semester for the privilege. The University of Houston is a public university. They will let anyone come in their library, but they won't let you take items out unless you're a U of H student, faculty, or staff. If I wanted to check out a book from the Dallas Public Library, I would have to pay for a $95 out-of-area user card to check out that item because I don't pay property taxes to the city of Dallas. The TechShare program is a cooperative effort among Texas libraries to allow members borrowing privileges at other libraries. What TechShare does is open almost all the libraries in the state of Texas to you, so you can get that book from Dallas without paying for that out-of-area user card. You can get your TechShare card from a library that you belong to. If you get it from your local public library, it'll be good for a calendar year. If you get it from your San Jack library, it'll be good for the semester. TechShare also gives Texas libraries leverage when contracting with database companies for database access. Because of our cooperative purchasing power, Texas libraries have access to a large number of article databases at a greatly reduced cost. What this means for you is that a lot of the databases that you're getting used to using as a student will be available to you at your public library long after you graduate. Every library needs its librarian. As long as there have been libraries, there have been librarians. Librarians are trained to organize, classify, and retrieve information. We have a master's degree, that is, at least 39 credit hours beyond a bachelor's degree. Academic librarians sometimes also have a second subject area master's degree. Librarians learn to set aside their personal prejudices when ordering items for the library and when dealing with people. It's often said that librarians are superheroes. Well, actually, Batgirl's day job was as a librarian, so I guess it's a little bit true. Librarians conduct themselves professionally according to the Library Bill of Rights, which was established first in 1939 and is updated as needed to reflect the changing times. Basically, we believe that libraries should provide value to our communities, 
We believe in freedom of information, open access to information, and in fighting censorship. Librarians believe that access to libraries should be provided to all people of the community, that our libraries should contain items covering all points of view. Remember, I said we're trained to set aside our personal prejudices. We challenge censorship, resist the abridgment of free expression and access to ideas. A person's right to use a library should not be denied, should be provided on an equitable basis. All people possess a right to privacy in their library usage. As a librarian, I don't care what you look like, how you're dressed, who you worship, who you sleep with, where you're from, or what you smell like. When you come in my library and ask me for help, I am there to help you. I don't care what you ask me, I will help you locate the information you need. I might look at you a little warily if you ask me where the bomb making books or the books on poisons are, but I'll find them for you. I defend your right to have access to those books. I might blush a little if I have to hand you a book with naked people on the front cover, but that's my problem, not yours. Please don't ever be afraid to ask a librarian a question. We're there to help you. And we've heard just about everything over the years. I've even been asked how to read a book before. The American Library Association even has a statement on the freedom to read. In part, it states, we believe that reading is essential to our democracy and is guaranteed by the Constitution. Librarians will fight and even go to jail over your right to privacy and to fight censorship. Every September, we celebrate our fight against the censors with Banned Books Week. There is always someone who objects to something we have on our shelves. In fact, librarians are fond of saying, my library has something to offend everyone. Have you ever read one of the Twilight books? Harry Potter? How about the Bible or the Koran? Huckleberry Finn? Just about anything you've ever had to read in school that's been made into a movie and every single major religious text appears on the banned books list. Add to that most children's books, anything with foul language or sex in it, and you get the idea. Librarians have procedures in place for when people raise objections to books. Sometimes the censors make a valid point and the book is removed from circulation. After all, we serve our communities. And if the whole community objects, then we do have to consider it. Very seldom does an entire community object, however, and probably 98% of the time the books stay on the shelves. After 9-11, the USA Patriot Act was passed by Congress to make it easier for the government to pursue terrorists. One of the things the Patriot Act allows is for the government to view your personal records, including your library records. The library world counteracted that by changing our library systems so that when you return a book, that book record is automatically separated from your patron record in our system. What that means is that nobody, not the library, not the government, and not even you, can ever see what you have checked out in the past. Now, we can still see what you have currently checked out, and the government can subpoena those records, but we're going to fight tooth and nail not to give them up. Much as journalists fight not to identify their sources, librarians will fight not to turn over your records because it is nobody's business what you are reading or what you are searching on the internet when you are using a library computer. Fortunately, librarians aren't called on to do these things very often. Our main job is to help you do your research, choose and narrow your topic, find and evaluate your sources, and then cite those sources when you find them. Remember, we are always here to help and there are many ways to contact us. Just ask a librarian.